operate within what is often referred to as information warfare. And we're, we're in it, whether we want to be in it or not. And, and the only way we can do something positive about it is to become aware of it. And just, just become aware that there is a complex set of dynamics within which we operate, which are largely opaque, uh, that are intended to divide us against ourselves. And some of the problem is international, sure, but lots of it is domestic. And if we don't start acting like vigilant uh, information consumers and always seek a path that is less fragmenting, uh, then we're gonna be in a lot more trouble than we're already in. We're already in a lot of trouble. The best we can do at this point is kind of earn the right to fight the next battle uh, and the stakes are high. Robert Madney returns to the Plutopia podcast, this time discussing the events of January 6th and the internet chatter preceding the insurrection. We also explore strategies for identifying the sources of disinformation and countering their messaging. Hey, welcome back to the Plutopia News Network. Today our guest is Rob Matney. Rob is the Managing Director of Government Affairs at Yonder. And why don't you define that for us, Rob? What does that mean exactly? Oh, well, uh, I, I work with our public sector clients to make sure that their use case and their needs are being met by the set of solutions that uh, Yonder provides. Um, so that's what the, just from the kind of technicalities of the role, it just means I, I get to engage with those users, understand their problems, understand their workflow, and help ensure that what we're providing supports them. And what kind of solutions do you provide to those public sector, like government uh, clients? Well, I'm mean, fundamentally the same that we provide to all of our clients, which is visibility, uh, transparency into the influence mechanics of the internet, uh, and, and specifically, maybe perhaps more specifically, identifying uh, the ways in which uh, networks of hyperactive accounts influence the spread of narratives and influence each other as networks, uh, and the detection of the emergence of novel narratives and uh, their trajectory throughout the various platforms, uh, significant platforms that are out there. So it's like kind of a listening platform on steroids? Yeah, yeah, that's about right. I, I, and, and with a specific interest in how uh, groups behave and interact with each other, um, and also with some additional focus on fringier platforms, uh, less mainstream platforms, because I mean, one, one, of the, one of the potential difficulties with listening platforms is that they can exacerbate the dilemma of disinformation because they are literally reporting on the things that people are doing to gain success and calling it success. So there's a way in which listening platforms are, are symptomatic of the problem in ways. So have you seen some like light traces of disinformation on the internet recently? Yeah, a bit. A bit. <laughs> there, there has been a lot, of course. It's been a pretty intense um, number of weeks for, for disinformation uh, being spread uh, with, with clear intent to manipulate and radicalize and influence people. Yeah, it's, it's really been uh, a lot. So one thing that happened today was um, there was a briefing uh, about this plan for 4,000, I guess you'd have to call them terrorists, uh, to surround the Capitol and prevent Democrats from entering the Capitol and, you know, potentially with weapons and so forth. Um, is that the sort of thing that you guys pick up when you're listening? Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly are able to pick up plans, right? You know, on platforms, publicly available information where people are saying, hey, let's all get together and do this. Uh, our visibility doesn't go into walled gardens, 
right? So we do focus on publicly available information, but you know, there's the there's the quandary. If you wish to to spread something at large, you do actually have to meet the public where they already are, uh, and so at some point uh, to get to a large scale, then that narrative is going to have to burst out at least onto one of the fringier platforms and then onto the mainstream. And so we do catch uh, that. And I think it's worth underlining that there's this dissolving distinction between the online world and the physical world. It, it, it's no longer really meaningful to speak of them as if they were different. So the, the things that are uh, uh, coordinated plans for physical activity do manifest online. That's the way they get coordinated. Yeah, yeah. so were you aware that this thing at the Capitol last week was gonna happen? I, I mean, yeah. Yeah, and I and a lot of people were, uh, you know, it's a uh, the the narrative around um, e even if we just narrow it down to really hyper specific hashtags, the narrative around rigged election starts to pop off in I, I want to say late December of 2019, certainly by early January of 2020, we're really cooking with oil on the rigged election narrative. And it um, it is aligning itself at that moment in time with the routine of the primaries. Uh, and it's picking up previous narratives and kind of recycling some of them, but establishing new narratives about the various nefarious ways uh, in which the primaries will be rigged and the, the vote stolen in any of a, a few number of directions. And, and by the time we get to, um, I wanna say late September, it starts to really gain traction in terms of the general election. And you start to see a few pop-offs of Stop the Steal. So rigged election becomes Stop the Steal, this prediction that the general will be stolen. And along the way, it gets kind of sutured into the cluster of QAnon narratives. Um, and, and of course, that's such a powerful cluster of, of um, narratives. There, there's so many people, well, there's, there's enough people who like to talk a lot about it. Um, th then it kind of coalesces into a master uh, narrative. And, and now they're really tightly aligned, this QAnon and um, stop the steal. By the time we get just after the uh, general, the, the hashtag really is taking off, the stop the steal hashtag. And prior to then, you're already seeing the only way to stop the steal is to have uh, an armed gathering. Um, and, and um, you know, there's adjacent ones that are even more militant. You, you might see references to the three percenters. This is this um, narrative that at the moment of the American Revolution, took up arms. And it was owing to those three percent who took up arms that America was able to of defend its independence from from uh, from England, and and so there's there's more uh, explicit references to being armed, but even the stop the steal, which has a lot of traction, uh, has references to an armed demonstration, and by the time we're in late December, you know, around Christmas time it's starting to center on January 6th. And, and, and so all of which is a long-winded way of saying anyone who was following the publicly available information um, with any focus would have seen plenty of references to showing up armed on January, 20, uh, on January 6th in DC. Well, the uh, publicly available information uh, menu changed after the 6th. There was a lot of reshuffling, a lot of cancellations of uh, previously well-used uh, um, uh, media and uh, social media and online resources. Have you been able to 
track of where that migration has gone? Uh, it, it's a little bit early to tell where the, if we want to call it the parlor diaspora is going to go to. Um, uh, certainly, we can reasonably expect that some will take the path of least resistance and go to GAB, um, which incidentally, there's uh, a, a bigger story there about the hosting infrastructure of, of Parler um, maybe going to the same hosting infrastructure that hosts GAB. But so some users will take the path of least resistance and get to a kind of apples to apples feature set analog, which is GAB. And, uh, which has about a fourth of the user base historically. GAB has about a, a fourth of the user base um, to uh, Parler, or at least as of November, that was true. Um, we also saw data with people saying, you know, come to me on Telegram. So, so there's at least anecdotal, I don't know how broad the data is, but anecdotal evidence that some will spread to uh, Telegram. Um, Telegram, of course, has public, like Facebook, for example, has both uh, public and private channels. Um, and that really underlines something, which is that there's another very reasonable prediction to make, which is that uh, uh, many of these users will go into peer-to-peer -peer, uh, and otherwise encrypted channels, um, such as group chats on, you know, you can imagine platforms like uh, signal, et cetera, um, in order to connect. But, but of course, that's going to present a problem because to get people to attach to you on one of those platforms actually is more difficult. So then what kind of um, penetration do you have at massive scale? Um, so there's, there's some questions, but it's reasonable that we're going to see a, a fragmentation. I, I guess I want to use the term of balkanization with the hopes that that, that that doesn't, the term doesn't bother anyone, but a balkanization of, of users into smaller and more niche platforms where some of those platforms are peer to peer encrypted platforms. Well, when the uh, Stop the Steal meme began to appear, did it relate at all to Trump's polling and his? Uh, his messaging? Oh, I mean, I, I never correlated it to polling per se, but there's no question that um, that um, the, the language uh, that the president used, it, you know, referenced a stolen election. You know, there, there was a tight integration between um, the language that was being used uh, at rally speeches and the language that was being used um, in, in the content, the post content. Uh, and, and certainly that is also true of, uh, of, of a lot of uh, supporters um, for the president um, and sometimes spokespeople. So just personally, would your conclusion be that it not just Trump giving his speech on the day of uh, the elector count, but also a lot of this like preliminary stuff, was it driving a, a kind of planned uh, assault on the Capitol? Yeah, I mean, yes, these fellow citizens uh, who engaged in insurrection, a steady stream of lies over the course of months, uh, uh, then weeks and days at an increasing level that was clearly intending to result in a show of force uh, at the at, at you know on the Capitol grounds. Um, can, can we say with certainty uh, that that it um, was desirous to result in what happened or was intended to result in what happened? I can't say with certainty, but certainly a massive show of force on the Capitol grounds on January six there's no meaningful question that that was the desired outcome. Yeah. Uh, do you think that that other countries were involved in driving that and influencing that response? In the long term, absolutely. Uh, it, it, in terms of broadly speaking, societal fragmentation um, uh, 
amplifying narratives of distrust around polling places. Uh, absolutely, uh, and, and, and a host of them. Um, uh, in terms of sort of immediate scale, um, shorter term uh, planning and proposing events and um, encouraging armed uh, activity, I have, um, but I mean, I think it's, it's worth noting that the, it, it is certainly, the events of last week are certainly the consummation of goals that have even been documented um, by adversarial foreign powers specifically and reported on in the Miller report and other, uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee report um, that, you know, specifically say what we're going to do is get the American people to fight themselves and we're going to do it by uh, fragmenting their ability to trust each other. Ooh, those guys are good. It seems to be working. <laughs> indeed, indeed. They are <sighs> good at what they do, for sure. So now we have uh, a deplatforming of like Parler and and actually specific accounts as well. Um, what is the effect of this on potential? I mean, I refer to these people as terrorists, I guess. What is the effect yeah. of it, though, on of deplatforming on on the people who are likely to show up again? Is it helping? Uh I mean, there, there's plenty of research that underlines that in the short term, uh, it does help. Um, it, it, it also, as I as it was indicated in a thread by um, my CEO, our, my colleague Jonathan Morgan, earlier today, um, it also has been seen in the past to further radicalize the most ardent supporters of whatever is the agenda that's getting deplatformed. So the, the, the more casual participants um, will, will not be interested in the barrier of entry that's now higher to get them there. Uh, the group, uh, but the most ardent believers in uh, uh, or believers in the effort uh, of that group will become more radicalized um, and more inclined to find other ways of uh, coordinating. So, so it, yes, short term, yes, long term, it's going to be problematic. And this, like you know, this problem globally, like spam, is a problem that we manage, not a problem that we solve. Yeah. Yeah, I actually saw Jonathan's thread today, and mm -hmm. I, I saw that he came to that conclusion too. Uh, so, what happens now with, say, Parler? What Parler has been cut off from hosting, and it's—I uh, think their DNS was even well. They had to shift their their uh, their registration of their domain name, I believe. Um, are they going to be able to come back from this? You know, other people that I work with. Um, are uh, expect a prompter return than I do, so I, I think I think the landscape is difficult for a little while for them. Uh, I I think um, so. You know, the the CEO comes out and immediately says we might be down for up to a week. I think he then posted something that sort of obliquely hedged that, maybe indicating would be be very wrong, uh, and I'm sure. My two friends, Scoop and John, will will hold my feet to the fire if and when I'm wrong. Uh, but I think it's going to be a longer haul. Um, they, you know, aside from losing their hosting and its associated CDN, and remember, of course, they're going to have to have a content delivery network at any moment in time because they're uh, a honeypot for, you know, designated denial of service attacks. Um, Getting, getting a service that can deliver them both um, is going to be significant. And that hosting company is going to have to be willing to kind of touch the third rail that they reflect right now. And uh, if they don't find a host, uh, 
a, a colo facility. And even colo managers, you know, admin companies, are going to find them to be a bit of a third rail. And if they find one that is comfortable with them, they're going to have to buy uh, hardware and then manage that hardware. Uh, and if they then subsequently get deplatformed by that colo facility, they're going to have to physically move hardware. Um, and that's not the kind of company they are. And then the third option there is even more unimaginable, which is they build their own network operations center. There is a fourth option. And the fourth option is that they find uh, a foreign host. But moving into an environment where you have a foreign host brings with it some concerns that would have to be managed, including increased ability to be surveilled um, uh, and also, you know, the narrative of the platform. And I want to point out that I think uh, on Parler, there are plenty of citizens that are um, exercising their freedom of speech and not fomenting violence, inciting violence and fomenting insurrection, right? Um, uh, the brand of the platform is, um, I'll call it libertarian patriotism. That's, that's how I'll, I'll describe the brand. And, and I feel like that's a difficult brand conception to maintain if you move offshore, uh, in particular to an offshore host that, that um, might not be very friendly um, uh, to the US. Yeah, there could so, be an optics problem there too, like if they moved it to Russia or China. Per precisely, that would be an optics problem. How, how would they maintain the, the brand? Maybe they could. So the question is, will one of their, will some hosting environment be willing to grab that third rail? And I saw something today that indicated that Epic, spelt with a K, the company that is currently the host for Gab and was previously the host for 8chan before 8chan became too um, unsavory for, for even Epic to continue hosting them uh, and, and then ran them off. Um, it is open to hosting them. So then they're gonna to have to transfer, but even then they have an uphill battle to climb because with them being out of the Google Play store and out of the Apple store, they can't supply updates. So one, they have to hope that their current installed version is able to connect to the new host. I imagine they deployed their DNS mapping in such a way that that's not gonna be a problem, but maybe not. Um, uh, so they're, they're going to have to rely on their installed base and they're going to have to very quickly improve their web client because their web client is graceless. Like their, their installed app is decent, but their web client is just the pits. And, uh, and, and that will be the only way that new users can get to them. Then perhaps they can establish some, um, some baseline moderation approaches. And then maybe they can work their way back into the app store. So it's, it's not pill climb. Well, you kind of uh, brought up a question earlier. Uh, I mean, there's a lot in what you've just said uh, to unpack. But one thing you mentioned is how there are a lot of people on Parler who are not fomenting violence, right? So is deplatforming Parler throwing out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to say. I mean, it, these things become judgment calls, don't they? I mean, there's, there's 4 million active users, if my memory is right, as of November on that platform. I could be wrong about that, but I think it's roughly 4 million. And, um, and, and so we, you know, we know that that's, um, uh, that, that that's a very big set and that, and that we, we can reasonably say there's an awful lot of um, uh, active users who, who are just exercising their free speech and not committing crime. Um, and, and there is a difficult conversation we should be having about, um, about where we encourage private companies to deplatform uh, people. Um, I, you know, that it has shown, in my opinion, a sufficiency of criminally inciting activity that it is better to put a put a stop to it now and deal with the consequences of the uh, of the spread um, and, and then try to to um, 
track new examples of inciting crime. I think it's probably on the balance worth it, but I'm no dogmatist about this. I don't think these decisions should be made easily. Uh, 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 you know, some people say it's a slippery slope, and my problem with that argument is that it ignores conveniently the fact that everything about everything in the universe is always on a multivalent slippery slope, and any pretense otherwise is self-delusion, but, but it is a particularly flavored slippery slope to say, well, that's really objectionable, so let's get rid of it. Um, yeah. Well, in the DOJ press conference today, they were talking about their investigations, trying to track down all the uh, participants in the insurrection at the Capitol and going through a lot of the online postings, the social media, the emails, whatever, you know, they've uh, received. And the guy made a comment that it, the difficulty is determining who are the real actors and who are the keyboard cowboys. And uh, how difficult is that uh, distinction? How do you, you know, sort through that mass of data and decide who's real and who's just playing? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I would, I would invite an even further distinction, which is to say, which of the keyboard cowboys actively incited violence? And, and you, you know, there are a First Amendment rights, and that includes direct incitement to, to violence, right? And so the fact that uh, a physical body didn't show up on the physical, uh, inside the physical Capitol building, um, to me is not necessarily an exclusion that they did something criminal. Uh, and and um, and so we should be looking for criminal activity, um, full stop. Um, th that said, the priorities need to be the people who showed up and and um, uh, and, and resulted in murdered you know murdered people and um, uh, and insurrection. Um, how do you sift through that data? Well. Uh, it, it, is there geotagging available? Is there media that indicates it? I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty difficult to sift through um, uh, in, in terms of, you know, uh, image pipelines. How do you, can, can you do a, an image, uh, an object detection algorithm that is able to see that door of the Capitol or, or that rotunda and then at scale surface all the images that include the inside of the rotunda, maybe. Uh, that would be a real undertaking though, um, from a data processing perspective and an algorithm success. And it's bound to have false positives. So you darn well better have some human in the loop curation to make sure that, um, uh, that, that only uh, who you're looking for who broke specific laws are adversely impacted. So it's a big lift. It's gonna be hard, I think. Somebody apparently hacked Parler and extracted pretty much everything they had uh, before the site went away. Uh, assuming, I'm not even sure it has gone completely away yet. But uh, I wonder what they plan to do with that. I mean, could that be useful as forensics? For sure. I mean, I saw reports of the hack. I have not seen the data. I intentionally did not go hunting into, um, into where the data is purported to be. I saw some screenshots of um, the database schema, and it included latitude and longitude, which, of course, you know, it is only as accurate as it is. But it 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 can get pretty specific. It can get pretty tight in its accuracy. Um, I have a colleague who who said they didn't think that data was actually there, uh, but I just haven't actually look at the data to validate. So, so if what's been reported is fully accurate, uh, there should be the ability to run searches against the latitude and longitude fields of the database schema. And that would be a pretty rapid low hanging fruit search. You mentioned the First Amendment earlier, and a lot of people are saying that this was like deplatforming people and like whole systems is a violation of their First Amendment rights, but that's incorrect, right? Correct, yeah. That's not what the First Amendment says. It says Congress shall make no law. Yeah, that's right. Pri private platforms absolutely can. Uh, private businesses absolutely can. Um, I mean, it, it, it's easy to, 
it, it, it we should always point that out because uh, people assert it with such certainty that this is a First Amendment infringement, and it's patently not. But I think there is an important question to wrestle, which is to the degree that we are having our civil discourse on these platforms and to the degree that the public square no longer exists and it's entirely digital, we at least and private. To say and that again. Pri and private. And in private, that's right. Uh, um, to the degree that that's true, we at least have to say, where is the, the town square? Is there, is there one? And are we protecting it with free speech? So there, that still doesn't get you off the hook of incitement to violence. If, if I go to, you know, whatever corner of the street and start yelling horrible things and encouraging violence, I'm. Um, so, yeah, I do push back on the First Amendment argument, but I also am sympathetic to the idea that we need to have uh, a society wide conversation that says, what does the First Amendment look like in a digitally platform dominant world? Yeah, and that might mean uh, proposed legislation. Uh, and I'm, I'm certain that there's going to be legislative proposals. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism of Section 230, mostly by people who don't seem to understand what it does. But this is a different thing. This question, I mean, Section 230 relieves some of those platforms of liability you know, if, if they do moderate. Um, but this is a whole other thing here, this question of how free is free speech and how do we ensure free speech and, and the problem of the monopolization of internet uh, conversation, uh, that there are monopolies in the social networking space. Uh, practically monopolies. I mean, Facebook, by virtue of its network effect, really holds a kind of monopoly there. And what is their responsibility? And I don't think, I think they wrestle with that and have a lot of trouble figuring it out themselves. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I don't have much to add other than degree with everything you said. I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've talked to people that I know who work at Facebook, and it sounds like internally, you know, there's all kinds of like conflicted thinking because it's not an easy problem to address. It's not like, oh, they should just do something. Well, what are they going to do? They really have a lot of things to balance in trying to decide what their response is going to be. And I think the thing at the Capitol was like throwing a big switch, you know, and it's like, a lot of the things that they've been hesitant to do, they just damn well were going to do. And that was because there was a clear and present danger. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you happen to know whether these, uh, um, the various deplatformings that we're seeing are intended to be permanent or just indefinite? Well, so, I mean, a bit of both, right? Um, uh, you know, I, I don't think Amazon Web Services is likely to turn around and, and host Parler, not without a long arc redemption story. We could imagine a long arc redemption story, but, but that's going to be a long arc. Um, but we also see a lot of, you know, uh, well, account suspension, which is the name indicates is not a termination, right? It, it, it can come back. And one of the things that excited me most, I think it was today, it could have been yesterday, time is fuzzy right now, but um, what was clear policy announcement from Twitter about the clear progression of disciplinary activity against accounts. And you know, when we when we think about what I think is at the heart of the right solutions, the heart is visibility and transparency. We should all know what the contracts are that we're going into, where the boundaries are, and have them clearly communicated. And so Twitter setting up a, look, you infract X many times, you get this punishment, this many times. And what it does is stair step up. So there's, if I'm remembering right, there's five or is it 10? It felt, my memory says it's divisible by five, but there's a progressive set of steps before your account gets permanently banned. Um, 
and and it's very clear what leads to it and you know there there is definitely research that says it is repeat offenders that are the worst offenders and so if you if you have a system for getting rid of the repeat of offenders instead of just indefinitely giving them putting them in Twitter jail for 48 hours and then letting them out and never letting the next instance be informed by the last instance, right? If you have a clear progression, then I think you start to move towards a, a healthier um, environment. I mean, it's true of all communities, isn't it? We, we, we say there's some behavior we won't tolerate. And in the healthiest systems, we say, but there's a way to come back from it. So many times we'll let you come back from it. Uh, and there might be steeper penalties. But at some point we say, we're done with you. You're not welcome in this community anymore. And so my hope is that other platforms follow the good model that I saw announced by Twitter today or yesterday. Well, historically, conservatives have not been real keen on promoting free speech, unless it's just their free speech. And all of a sudden, you know, they're very up in arms about suddenly having their speech uh, imperiled up uh, why, why why do you think, whoop, was that a conservative <laughs> <laughs> i never knew that about about my dog viola why do you think there was a sudden change uh it's pretty obvious but do you have opinions on that I mean, I, I think that um, uh, I think that most um, conservatives, uh, certainly traditional conservatives, um, would say that they are uh, absolutely proponents for free speech. Um, the, and so the, and there could be a mismatch between what they think about themselves and how they behave, for sure. Um, but, but I do think that the, the brand, um, the, the self-conception, the idea is, is uh, you know, not just property rights, but also freedom of speech and freedom of religion, these kind of core, you know, um, tenets of, of the Bill of Rights. Um, and the, I, I would say the mismatch really for me and I, mean, I think this is probably what you're asking, Scoop, it is about what, what John underlined, which is in other contexts um, saying, hey, listen, that protest, which is happening uh, during my sports ball event that I love, that shouldn't be permissible. Those private companies should stop that from happening because I don't want my uh, mellow, harsh, with this political stand and that this isn't a free speech issue because that's a private, um, uh, privately owned institution. So that speech should absolutely be stopped. And then in this context where uh, these platforms as John articulated are uh, not abridging first amendment rights, they're executing their rights as private companies this now feels like a freedom of speech issue to them. So I, I think it's about hypocrisy around what we think of as, uh, as um, First Amendment protected freedom of speech. Yeah, the Republican Party has always been the champion, uh, or the old Republican Party was always a champion of business and uh, being able to control uh, their destinies. And then all of a sudden this happens and they're not so much uh, in that uh, championing of <laughs> of business being independent suddenly it's a uh, it's a different ball game. I mean, you know, they've been they've been fed a long um, narrative of lies that they're disproportionately um, affected by deplatforming practices on the platforms, and and the truth is that does not appear to be so. Uh, if you look at the activity and the proportion that gets deplatformed. In my estimation, what you see are the platforms engaging in a, a kind of desperate set of both sides-isms in order not to seem biased. In other words, disproportionately punishing perspectives on the left um, in order to seem like they're balanced because there is so much radical speech uh, from the right on these platforms. Um, 
that, that is, I mean, not just radical, but radicalizing, you know, and incitements to violence and other things that are highly problematic. And so, I, they, but they, they've received the lie now, and now anyone gets deplatformed, and it just furthers the notion that um, the conservative perspectives are getting disproportionately silenced on the platforms, which I, I contest. I do not think that's happening. I forgot to <laughs> punch something. Yeah, the uh, first thing President Trump uh, ran to in explaining the uh, insurrection was to point at Portland and Seattle and say, well, they did it. So uh, it's not as bad. It's worse there than it was here. And that didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, so it seems to be the new... Uh, agenda, just particularly with the president, uh, no matter what the uh, charge is, he's going to point to something on the other side that was way, way worse than what he did. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and, and projecting as well. Uh, I mean, you know, that, that look, there, there was, there was looting and, and rioting in some of these protests. And, and I think it's appropriate to point out that those were protests, um, uh, from people who are protesting their uh, extrajudicial murder uh, at, at a disproportionate rate, whereas this is uh, a protest that led to an insurrection uh, about not liking a lawful vote outcome. Uh, and to me, those seem obviously just worlds apart, but there was federal property damaged and destroyed in some of those protests. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, probably um, there should be some appropriate, um, you know, legal prosecutions in those cases. But, but there, there's another inequity too, which was the response, right? I mean, we saw wildly aggressive law enforcement responses to those protests. Uh, and we obviously did not see an aggressive law enforcement response last Wednesday. Well, let's say that they came to you and said, Rob, we're putting you in charge of dealing with online radicalization. What, what would be the steps you would take at that point? Oh, goodness, what a good and difficult question. Um, I put together a committee to now. Um, you would sink your dog on them. <laughs> uh, yeah, right, exactly. I mean, you know, I'm, I am persuaded. I think I may have mentioned this before. Last time we talked, <laughs> I'm going to go to mute for a moment. John, entertain us. Scoop, entertain us. I'm going to mute my dogs. Should I sing something? I mean, sure. Of course, you should. You should always sing something. Okay, I'm just going to power through and see yeah, how. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the dogs are, are a welcome addition. <laughs> it's certainly a welcome addition to my life. What were you about to say, Scoop? Dogs have First Amendment rights, too, <laughs> if you ask a dog. Yeah. In this house, they, they pretty well do. They have a lot of rights in this house. Wow. Um, uh, I am persuaded by uh, our, our friend Mike Godwin's framing of uh, the... Um, uh, information fiduciary model, uh, wherein we investigate how to assign a fiduciary role to the platforms that is similar in genre, but not in specific, well, similar in some specifics, to the ways that we expect a fiduciary responsibility from a doctor or an attorney or a, uh, some sets of financial advisors, and that that fiduciary is not um, just to um, uh, protect the, the state from the people, but also the people from the state. In other words, they have a responsibility to handle the fidelity of information uh, in their platforms in such a way that it protects privacy of citizens' information, uh, but then also uh, proactively works against disinformation and that the framework provides for punishments for failure 
to behave in good faith as a fiduciary uh, of that information. And uh, Godwin's got a, a really good book on this and I highly recommend it though I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, and, uh, and so I, I would, I would wanna pursue that and start seeing if we can get traction on that. Uh, most importantly, I would just uh, push for uh, a, a industry group that includes stakeholders from all the major platforms who work together cooperatively to come up with meaningful industry standards, all of which redound towards transparency. Because the, the problem here is that we, we as users, by and large, don't understand the dynamics of how influence is happening on the platforms. And I mean, partly that's because these algorithms are tightly guarded secrets uh, uh, that, that they use in order to monetize. But there's going to have to be a cost on some of the profits in order to create an environment where the users understand how information is spreading, uh, not only within a platform, but between platforms. So I'm for transparency here. I want sunlight. Mike, who is carrying the weight of Godwin's Law right now because it's being invoked quite a bit. Uh, but the name of his book, I think the one that you're referring to is The Splinters of Our Discontent, Indeed. How to Fix Social Media and Democracy Without Breaking Them. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, It's a great title, The Splinters of Our Discontent. He's a smart one. So uh, the one other issue that I can think of in trying to manage this is just scale. I mean, if you have a billion users, it's sort of like going to Reddit and trying to be part of the conversation and looking and seeing, oh, this post had 1,276 responses or something, or 1,276 responses. How do you, you know, how do you even manage it? Uh, AI is an obvious response to that question, but AI is imperfect. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the scale is difficult. And of course, it's part of where, um, where these companies have really busted their shin, right? I mean, having a, a, a fleet of moderators um, uh, has <laughs> at best been a partial success <laughs> to the problem, right? And, and to the, that can only be said in the major languages. But when you get into the, the um, less populated languages, I mean, you, you know, you're seeing, you're seeing specific incitements to mass murder that appears to be having an effect and there's just not a moderator in that language who can work with any complaints about it right so i mean it has to be an ai solution to some degree it has to be um, yeah, and then we just oh, one go of ahead. the problems with human moderation which would be ideal is the cost i mean to have a, a moderator with the kind of discernment that they could actually be effective as moderators or really as facilitators, um, you would have to pay those people more than you could afford to do at scale. I mean, if you had to have armies of them. Yeah. Yeah. They, you know, I, I'm on a system called the well, and I know you're familiar with the well, uh, whole earth electronic link where the moderation is handled by uh, hosts actually, and they were originally called fair witnesses. And those people are responsible for a particular subject area. They refer to it as a conference on the well, and they're all volunteers. Uh, and it would be great if you could have uh, a system uh, including a lot of like volunteers, if people could voluntarily police the area, you know, versus having to formalize it. But of course, that's another thing that doesn't work at scale very well. I mean, to your point, if we just example great communities uh, online, the well, some subreddits, right? I mean, Reddit's a really interesting case because it has some of the most toxic things available anywhere on the internet. And then it also has some of the most healthy, supportive conversations that are you know, engage in disagreement and, and do so in a civil tone and sometimes make converts, right? There's some great, there's some great subreddits. And, and of course, Reddit allows 
for varying degrees of moderation. And we can also think of Vimeo. Like Vimeo's established a community of people who engage with each other in mostly respectful terms. But of course, uh, the, you know, I think one of the gold standards is Wikipedia, which relies on an immense army of dedicated volunteer labor to keep that content overall, certainly far from perfect, but pretty dang strong. Yeah, I mean, I think it could be, if we could actually educate people about how to have good civil conversation and have that be widespread versus these sort of drive by posts and ad hominems and flame wars that have become so common on the internet, that would be a huge step in the right direction. But we're not going to do it unless we start it like when they're six years old, you know, elementary level. Yeah. So, so just on that topic, and th this may seem like a segue, so pull me back if it is, but it's, it's a new idea to me and it's so intriguing and I'm kind of in love with it. I was on a, a phone call or a video call uh, over the weekend with someone who was an elementary school buddy, someone who, who I was good, good pals with in elementary school. And then we continued our, our, our school days together. Um, and he has gone on to have quite an uh, um, uh, impressive military career. And he went to West Point, uh, one of the military service academies. And uh, he was articulating his desire to see through to fruition a civil service academy in the United States that takes similar modeling as the military service academies where they are, when they're not um, teaching military arts, are really just super high-end liberal arts colleges, right? Really high-end educational institutions who also have the ability to pull, um, uh, you know, really top scoring students. Uh, it's very competitive to get in uh, in a variety of ways. Um, and to create an environment where those things are true and the uh, curriculum, other than elite university curriculum, is actually how to be uh, a thoughtful, uh, excellent uh, civic participant in our democracy. And in exchange, uh, just like with the military service academies, you owe a certain number of years, your tuition is free, your room and board is free, but in exchange, you owe some years of service in civil service uh, and, and with the hope that also it would help uh, uh, create a um, more thoughtful set of potential politicians after that civil service requirement is fulfilled. Well, yeah, I mean, when you think about it, if you, you wouldn't have to like make everybody better at once but if you made a whole lot of people better and released them into the wild to be better in many contexts they could sort of raise the level of conversation it sounds like almost a domestic version of jfk's peace corps yeah i think there's a real analog there i mean i don't know what my, my pal would say about that connection but i think that's right scoop and wow. something like that would be a great help to uh, particularly rural America, which has just been ignored when it comes to infrastructure, medical care, you name it, they don't have it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, I mean, obviously other, other nations that have compulsory draft uh, will often have a pathway for various kinds of civil service. So, you know, uh, um, obviously in Israel, you can not go into the military, uh, but you can do specific other things. In, in, in Germany, uh, you can become a doctor, you can go to medical school, that will fulfill your compulsory draft requirement. And, and I, don't, I don't know the nuances of those two, let alone any of the others, but I think there are models out there for saying, it's we need to at least supply a way for people to become civically engaged and to make it um, a real honor to serve uh, as citizens uh, and competitive and and directly beneficial if you do. Yeah. 
So I think we're getting close to the end of our time here. We asked you to spend an hour with us, and we're at about that. Uh, do you have closing remarks, Rob? Oh, I mean, yeah, I, I guess uh, my closing remark is just simply this, and it's a bit of a downer note, but I think in, until we recognize the, the problem, we, we can't start to fix it, which is just an exhortation for all of this to recognize that we operate within what is often referred to as information warfare. And we're, we're in it, whether we want to be in it or not. And, and the only way we can do something positive about it is to become aware of it and just, just become aware that there is a complex set of dynamics within which we operate, which are largely opaque, uh, that are intended to divide us against ourselves. And some of the problem is international, sure, but lots of it is domestic. And if we don't start acting like vigilant uh, information consumers and always seek a path that is less fragmenting, uh, then we're going to be in a lot more trouble than we're already in. We're already in a lot of trouble. The best we can do at this point is kind of earn the right to fight the next battle. Uh, and the stakes are high. That's 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 my closing remarks. Yeah, the way I've been saying it is that t people talk about how there might be another civil war. We have a civil war right now, and it's been a cold war, but it's getting hot. Yeah, well, and sir. we got to find the peace. We can't just let this thing, let the whole American experiment blow up on our watch. Yeah, and unlike the military, there's no rules of engagement or articles of war <laughs> in information warfare. It's just every person for themselves. Absolutely. God against all. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well, thanks, Rob. Really appreciate you joining us today. This is a very timely conversation. Thanks for having me. I love chatting with you guys. I appreciate it. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future. <laughs>